So, how are you, my friend? Um, thanks for coming on the show. Um, this yeah, segment pleasure. of the show is, is simply called What Are You At?, which is kind of a Newfoundland <laughs> phrase for what's going on. What am I at? Well, uh, first thing I should mention is that our entire uh, our entire crew were at Newfs. So, you know, what are you at? Was I'm very conversant with what are you at, and and uh, you know we had a, a great uh, bunch of people. We we sort of na- uh, snagged them from the Thomas Trio and the Red Albino. We went on tour with those guys, and and then sort of ripped all their crew off. And who who was in the crew then? Would that been Brian amazing? Power was our sound man. He he yeah. was the main guy. Yeah, Brian Power. Um, we had Danny from the uh, Thomas Drew, Danny Thomas, uh, and uh, Lil, and all those guys. At some point, were doing different things. And yeah, great group of guys. I grew up with all those guys back home. Me and Danny were best friends, right. um, skateboarding buddies and punk rock buddies back in the day. And of course, Brian, Brian was one of us as well. He was the one who used to, you know, snag the 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 sound system from the back of Fast Freddy's audio, and uh, <laughs> set it up for all of our punk shows back home in Newfoundland, which was great. Nice. Um, the Thomas Trio. I forgot you guys had a connection there. That's right. In the early '90s, that when the Thomas Trio were first coming up here, that was that was kind of about the time that you guys were breaking, right? Late '80s, early. Yeah, 90s. And it, I think those were some of the first tours we went on. Yeah. Uh, the very the very first tour we ever went on was uh, was with the Jazz Butcher from England. Yes. And I don't know how you would do this as a as a template for young bands, but it worked amazingly for us, which was that our manager at the time had the sense to send us out with with the jazz butcher all the way west and then he booked not the same quite the same size clubs but slightly smaller clubs in the same cities on the way back from that tour so we went out and it just so happened also that the jazz butcher was releasing his his most mopey album right <laughs> and uh, and so every night we came out first and sort of like lit the place on fire and we were full of piss and vinegar and 25 years old and then the jazz butcher came out and was a little on the mopey side so i think that also helped us you know, in stark release, relief of us being, you know, extra high octane than we actually were. Uh, so all the people, or, you know, not all the people that saw us on the way out, but an awful lot of those people that saw us on the way out came back two weeks later and saw us on the way back. And we kind of instantly had a, had a crew, you know, like had a fan base kind of across the, the country, which is very unusual. Usually you gotta, as you know, usually you gotta hit it a few times and build something but we we were able to build it quite quickly and then we went out east with the thomas trio guys and and just hit it off with those guys those guys and then a band called cadillac tramps out of orange county california we, we became uh, buddies with them and toured and i think the first time i ever saw cadillac tramps they were they opened for us at the town pump in vancouver and for whatever reason the rest of the guys in the band were in the dressing room and i was the only guy who was up in the pit watching them and i walked in, into the dressing room and i was kind of, i guess i was kind of white as a ghost and they were like what what's up and i'm like we gotta fucking bring our a game because these guys are off the hook like these guys are insane but it was one of those things where you know like playoff hockey or something it was like anytime we played with the with the thomas tree or cadillac tramps or whatever like we were just on our on our a game because we had to be so what are you okay so we went from way back now i'm just going to hit you right with like what are you doing today like what's what's on your calendar these days when you wake up in the morning well, interestingly, literally today, uh, 10 minutes before we started to have this conversation, I uh, am just getting some bed tracks sorted for a new record, a new Lost of the Low record that we started last week. Wow. Uh, in John Critchley's studio, speaking of uh, back in the day, 13 Engines fame, mm-hmm. he has a little uh, rehearsal place that we rehearse in, and it's a studio as well, so we did the beds for that. And I've been painting, I paint it kind of I'm painting not every day, but almost every day, doing uh, visual art and uh, writing songs. I've got my band, the Do Good Assassins, as well, and I've somehow over this year of COVID, I wrote a full record for the Low and a full record for the DJ. So we're gonna make we're each gonna make a record this year. Excellent. We just started the, the Low one, and it's very exciting because uh, you know people thought I was pissed before. Holy cow! These songs, I'm pretty pissed <laughs> these days. <laughs> I was just listening, like I, I, I bought the, I don't know if you got the new Clash triple album that just came out, the um, the uh, Combat Rock uh, three album thing with the- uh, It was Something Hall, it's like a, was it? Yeah, yeah, the the Something Hall, whatever, I can't remember what it's called, but um, I, I threw it on the other night and um, Know Your Rights came on. And I mean, I, I, I'm always listening to old music, but I haven't listened to Know Your Rights in a long time. And as soon as, as, soon as it started, the, the lyrics just hit me and I went, this is the same thing like you know 40 almost 50 years later it's the same yep. thing that we're all complaining about it's the you know the 
anyways, we're, we're all angry and I'm really excited to see what you've got to come up with. That'll be great. Well, uh, the other thing is uh, watching, uh, seeing cl old clips of Bernie Sanders in like 1972 and he's, he's like, listen, billionaires have to, you know, and it's like, it was like, oh my God, how's he, how's he stayed sane? I know. Having to say the same things for 60 years, you know, like, and for instance, like we have a song that I think is going to make on, make it on this record, which is called When the Boot Comes Down. And I wrote it in 1983 um, because I was in a band, my first band, Social Insecurity, actually David, who plays low in the, uh, plays drums in the low, was also in, in Social Insecurity in 1983. And we had a song called When the Boot Comes Down. And I was like, we should put this on the record because sadly, <laughs> it's every bit as uh, relevant as it was. You know, there's a couple of, there's a couple of little lyric tweaks here and we've, and we've of course updated like the way the low plays it now as opposed to the way some 18 year old straight edge punks played it back then. But, um, but so that's fascinating, you know, disheartening, fascinating, uh, and also in some ways encouraging that, that, um, you know, what I don't like, Ken, is like, it's what scares me is when the issues are not as visible, you know, and people can be a little sleepier about them. Yeah. And for, for sure, nowadays, people cannot, I mean, if you say to me, I'm not into politics, it's like, well, you know what, politics is into you, and you're, it's going to affect your life in a major way, like you can, nobody can claim to be asleep, or, you know, not notice what's going on. I mean, this stuff is so right in your face. That it, it at least it, it, I always feel like, well, at least we know who the enemy is. We can sort of focus our, our uh, energies and our, our gatherings and aim them in the right direction. So hopefully, you know. Hey, Ken, uh, here we go. These are two videos. Uh, start with this one, The Barricade. Um, I know you can cut these up and do what you need to do with them. If not, this will be an adorable intro to the song. Uh, this is called Barricade. We're down the roads to see from your door. Lead one way is the other way And down the way is the crash on your shore Carry sailors' bones from shipwreck days When all those vicious handcuffed words Constrict, contract, constrain Well, I'll meet you on the barricade In the cool, defiant Hell on to your mother's story, an unwritten page. Well, he read you the rules, and she sent you to school, but she paid for the bars on your cage. And you played a poison violin in a symphony of rage. Now it's time you treated that fucker in for a place on the Sleep one. 
Right down to like I've had death threats over the over the last few years over politics, really? over politics from people who are fans of the band have been fans of the band, who are I don't know suddenly surprised I don't know what it is it's like it reminds me of that uh, that thing that meme, meme was going around for a while about Rage Against the Machine where some fan was getting really angry and saying you know like, I don't come to your to your shows to hear about politics and somebody else posted like what machine did they think he was right they yeah. were raging against the air conditioner like you know so it's like we, i've had that right to the point where we've had you know fans really angry and disappointed with our left views or or you know the, the person who, who sent the death threat was like you woke scum and it's like how are you like how is this so shockingly surprising what this band is about all of a sudden to you that wow. <laughs> that you want to murder somebody and you know of course it's just to me i i I took it very seriously, but at the same time, it's like, I, I think it's a, a mental health issue and I don't really think it's about, you know, figuring out why this person is surprised all of a sudden. I think it's an issue that is going on within them and, you know, but yeah, things, uh, shit's getting real in the street, that's for sure. When, have you always been an artist or is this something new? Uh, it's a thing like, you know, I drew as a kid, like a lot, all kids do. And, uh, and I, and I took art in school, uh, interestingly, like all through high school and everything, I, when given the option of music or art, I always took visual art, but, uh, I don't think I had ever painted. I think I might've done two paintings as projects in art class or whatever, but then as a, as a young adult and as an adult, as I say, like, you know, politics, music, it just kind of took over and I didn't really draw, even draw or anything. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, like I would go traveling around the world and either on tour or just myself traveling around and I almost would never go see a band anywhere, but I would always go to galleries all over the place. Oh, wow. So that was always a, an interesting, uh, I was always interested. And then when Jill and I um, got together and I think it was 99, maybe in 2000, we were in a gallery looking at a Frida Kahlo, George O'Keefe exhibit. And I just said, you know, it's all, I, I look at it, it's so tech, tactile. And I say, said to her, you know, I, I, I've always, I've always been interested in the idea of painting. Like it looks so cool. You know, I wonder what it's like to do. And so then I had a birthday coming up and she bought, you know, she had no money and we had no money. She bought me a, a sizable amount of painting supplies, but you know, hundreds of dollars worth of painting supplies. And so I had that, this flash moment of like, Oh shit. Like what if that was just an off the cuff <laughs> comment? Right. But um, so I tried it, but I knew I, I, I sort of knew, instinctually that I would like it and I the minute I started to do it I it became like a like heroin or something I was just uh obsessed and I was doing it all the time so that was probably 2001 I started painting uh and then for the longest time I was just obsessed with portraiture and I you know I did some cityscapes and some landscapes and uh some other stuff but it was mostly portraiture I kept coming back to and I had a fa uh, favorite painter that Jill and I had, just, uh, had seen at the Whitney Museum in, in around the same time called Alice Neal, who was a uh, fascinating painter. And what I loved about her is she started in the 30s and 40s, and she didn't really become famous until the, the second wave of feminism, like, like in the 70s or something, I think she got discovered by feminists because she had just been painting in anonymity you know, relative anonymity all that time. And then abstract expressionism came in in the 50s and to paint portraits was sort of like, what? You know, like you're using an abacus, what are you doing? Like, you know, it's like, so it was so out of touch and she just continued to do it. She lived in Spanish Harlem and she would paint her neighbors and everything. And it was, she called herself a collector of souls. Mm -hmm. And I thought that speaks to me because it speaks to my, I thought portraiture and the way I write lyrics, it's like, really, I'm just fascinated by humans as animals. And I want to know what makes them tick, whether it's, you know, the, the, the visual look of them and, and what you can tell from a painting uh, or lyrics or whatever. So I did that for a long time. And then the band got so busy that I, I probably didn't paint for a year, year and a half or something like that. And then COVID hit and then there was no music. So I had suddenly I had all this time and, and, uh, and energy to paint again. And I started doing these abstractions and these kind of, you know, half abstractions, half figurative stuff which I was calling like punk neo-expressionism or something. It's like, sometimes there was spray paint in them and slogans and stuff. And, and I just got on fire about that. So I, then I was, you know, bang, 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 did these big paintings and, and uh, really uh, feeling that energy it was kind of almost like live music. It was feeling like very visceral, you know, in a way that the portraiture is, is much more 
compact and much more uh, meditative and these were much more like action paintings and kind of you know so that was a whole other vibe <laughs> Song number two. Um, this one's brand new, so I'm probably going to screw it up, but um, don't worry. Everything's cool. Uh, this is called Brave New World. Oh, this brave new world is full of cowards and liars, holocaust deniers. All second guesses, second amendments, but who'll defend the new defendants? We see this brave new world, it's not for the faint of heart, for the lovers of a starving artist. It's for the rats and the worms and the snakes and vomits and bulls that can't keep their rage in their undergarments. If you're an anti anti fascist, then oh, oh, yeah, you to the man. We're gonna dance in the ashes till compassion is a fashion and live with open hearts. We're gonna weaponize affection, gonna march in a new direction. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, we're gonna dance in the ashes till compassion is a fashion and live with open hearts. We're gonna stop that infection, gonna march in a new direction. To this brave new world. Somewhere on the map Where no one has to ask Oh, what's the answer? That's the question A ballot or a bullet or an insurrection You gotta plant that flag And make some choices Raise some hell and raise your voices Your voices Your voices Your voices, your voices. A bell and a bomb Brave new world. So much of life, we know exactly what we're going to do. You know, we know where we got to go to our job. We know when we got to load in. We got, you know, when we got to do this, take your vitamins. You know, everything is pretty yeah. much like that. Whereas when I'm making art, like I, I don't really know the process. It's like even now with writing songs, pretty much, I, th I think it might be unsatisfying to people in interviews when they ask me, but it's like I sit down and I strum the guitar and I sing gibberish and I make noises and I grunt and I groan and I do different things. And then if I do that long enough, a melody starts to happen or something or i might say like i have a song called peace and quiet and i remember like grunting and groaning and gibberish gibberish and i said peace and quiet and then and it was like oh what does that mean you know what's that about and then i kind of reverse engineer from there almost in a way like why did i say that what does it mean so i don't know if that's just a subconscious if you're just getting into your subconscious letting trying to free up that part of just like don't don't think about it don't be embarrassed by it yeah you know make all the stupid noise you want um Lowest of the low are putting out a new album. Um, now, you guys, th this is when was your last album out? We've been on a bit of a roll. I think we've had a record. We had a record called Do the. Well, we did a box set. W Warner signed us uh, to do to do a box set, um, which which I was joking with the guys. I'm like, this happens a lot with Lowest of the Lowers, whereas I make a joke and then it becomes the thing. Which is how Shakespeare, my my butt, got named was by accident it was a joke and everything and then so this came around and rather than learn from my mistakes and bite my tongue i said hey it should be called shakespeare my box and then everybody went that's amazing and i was like no 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 it's not amazing it's ridiculous what <laughs> you know but that's what it became called shakespeare my box and um so they they signed on to do that and we had just made a record called do the right now uh, on pheromone which i think was 20 i'm probably going to get these dates off but i think 2017 we made do the right now and then 2018 the box set came out that had a, a sort of a whole b-sides and rarities vinyl in it as well 
and then we made a record called Agit Pop in 2019 yeah. uh, with David Bottrell, which was very cool. Uh, you know, for people who don't know David Bottrell, uh, he's won uh, Grammys for working with Tool and bands like that. But he also, uh, when he was young, he worked on So, the Peter Gabriel record. Yes. When he was 18 or something, he was working on that. So that was a bit wow. bizarre to be a bunch of little working class kids from Toronto who indie rockers who are making a record with a guy who was working with Peter Gabriel. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. So then we did that and then now this record. So it's pretty much, we've almost had like a record every year uh, since about 2017 or 2016. And it's been, it's been great. Cause that's always in my life has been my goal. Like Costello or people like that, that are very prolific and, you know, McCartney, they seem to be able to knock the records out and, you know, between my solo thing and the DJ and the low, I've been able to do something like that, but you know, still it's like a year and a half or whatever. I'm always trying to. When can we expect the lowest of the low album? Jesus, that's the other thing about waiting for vinyl. If it's going to be, we're, we're just now having this conversation about, do we wait for vinyl to release it or do we release it? And, and then the vinyl comes later, because if it's a matter of waiting for vinyl, then I think it's going to be next year, like early next year. Yeah. Whereas we could do it much quicker if that's not the case, but yeah, but, you know, yeah. vinyl, like I, I'm now that we're back to vinyl, I feel so like the first time I rebought vinyl and, you know, remembered and I stood there with the artwork this big in my hands and had to engage with flipping over the record. I was just so in love again with it that I feel, you know, I'm the guy in the band who's always like, because the last record was a double album gatefold. And the one before that was, you know, Lawrence has said to me, okay, no more gatefold, no more double albums. You know, <laughs> we're going to make a 10, 12 song record. Don't go crazy. Uh, Cause I love, I just love that. I love I all the art and everything. And and we have it. And I keep saying to him, you know, my, my philosophy is like, you know, we're going to get to do this for a certain period of time and then not. And so, you know, and as you said, we're not going to, nobody's going to get rich off these things. So what we have left is like, let's make a beautiful document, you know, that we can stare at when we're senile and try to remember what band it was that we were in. And I wake up in the morning and my eyes open. And the first thing I think of is what am I going to put on while I'm having my coffee? Yeah. And the last thing I do at night before I go to bed is have my glass of milk and smoke a joint and listen to one side of an album. And between the morning coffee and the glass of milk at the end of the night, the record player is going all day. Um, right. I love the tactile sense of it. I love listening to a side of an album or a whole album. Uh, I love the artwork. It's Well, that's the other thing, too, is on Spotify or any of the uh, of the uh, streaming places it's like how you know how are you going to find out who played bass on that record how are you going to find out who produced it you know you can't and it's like i mean i'm, I'm sure you can if you want to do a deep dive or, or find, go online or whatever but it's like that's the cool thing you sit like you just said sit you know have a coffee have a joint whatever you're doing looking at doing what you did when you were 16 years old going through the liner notes seeing who did what you know and you just start to connect the dots the person you like on this record and you know i found i was telling jill today that the uh, horn section that we were talking about London Calling as a, we, we were talking about making records. And I said, you know, the the ax, absolute uh, gold standard for me is London Calling because it was like, it's got all, it's almost as if they recorded the clash themselves live. And then they brought in all this beautiful, like the horn section, Revolution Rock. And, you know, the guy who played with Ian Jury on, on uh, Hammond and stuff like this, and just, you know, added all these beautiful touches, but just enough to make it kind of classier, but it's got all that energy and piss and vinegar. But the cool thing I found out was the horn section that's so incredible and so, you know, dub heavy and revolution rock is the same horn section that played on uh, Walking on Sunshine. <laughs> you know, like, wow. it's amazing. It's like, you know, yeah. but I, I'm glad I know that because it just puts a smile on my face that it's how crazy and versatile that horn section is, but also, you know, yeah. just how life is, you know, like, but you can't, it's, if you, you know, maybe, maybe not enough people care about that anymore, but it's like, I, I get that, like Spotify, having all those songs in your phone and everything, it's just way too convenient. Like, there's no way it's going away because it's just way too convenient, even for me or whatever. Like, you want access, you know, but like just doing that, like sitting back with the vinyl. I do that at night, too. You know, gals have gone to bed and I throw a Nina Simone record on or, you know, some, you know, Chaim or Silver Jews or whatever. It's something, you know, something that came out last week. It's just like sit there and and just immerse yourself in that world and, you know, take some time, you know, have a breath and take some time. You put on a side of a record and it's going to be 16 to 20 minutes long. Mm -hmm. So if you consider, you know, once or twice a day, just taking that 16 minute break to just listen to some music and not do anything else. It's an amazing mindfulness exercise, you know, I mean, it can. Yeah. Um, what we're telling people is take 16 minutes, 
calm down, listen to Bad Brains, chill yeah. out. You know. Oh yeah. Get I calm. Put on, I, I put on Into the Future. Um, I, I, I grabbed Into the Future just before Christmas, I think. And um, my wife's, my wife and me are like total difference. Like she's a school teacher. She was an A plus student. She doesn't do drugs. She doesn't drink. She doesn't have a music collection. She turns on the radio and whatever's on is fine with her. Like she's one of those, which is right. fine. We get along great, you know, barring that. Put on Bad Brains, uh, Back to the Future the other day. And like by the third song, she was like, who is this? This is fucking amazing. And I'm like, really? You're digging Bad Brains? It's so. <laughs> That's great. You know, because usually most of my hardcore stuff, she's kind of like, oh, can you listen to that one? <laughs> and I'm like, well, while we're not having dinner. But she yeah. loved the Bad Brains record. She just loved it. So I bought a few. I went out and bought the rest of the Bad Brains catalog because I'm a fan too. But uh, every time I put them on, she just she just digs the hell out of it. It's the weirdest thing. So strange. Still, some, still some mystery left there, Ken. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, It'll yeah. ride you guys out into the sunset. Exactly. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you again for your time, man. We'll talk to you before too long. Sounds good. Take Thanks care again. Cheers. Bye-bye.